for the next uh, session, uh, which is called What are Nutritionally Healthy and Sustainable Meals for School Children? We will go, well, in exactly, into exactly that question. And I think it links um, in, in a way to one of the, um, the points put in, in, in the program uh, around acceptability and, and uh, amongst others. So um, it, it is sometimes a, an issue that, that is raised uh, and a question that is raised. So what are then, how, how can we see these, um, the, these diets and meals, which are both healthy and sustainable from uh, an environmental uh, perspective, uh, and how how do we see uh, that in, from the point of view of uh, of school children, uh, both younger and, and and older ones? And we have a fantastic set uh, of speakers to help us navigate this question. Uh, starting with uh, Perrine uh, Nadod, who is a scientific project manager at the uh, Nutritional Risk Assessment Unit of the French Agency for Food, Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety, in brief ANSES. Um, and Perrine coordinates uh, a working group uh, whose goal is to inform dietary guidelines for people following a vegetarian diet. And Perrine, please. Thank you. Um, just waiting on the slide. Thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me to present the simulated impact of vegetarian school meal frequency in a French experiment. So as you said, I'm presenting on behalf of the Nutritional Risk Assessment Unit of the French Agency for Food, Environmental and Occupational Health and Safety, and call ANSYS. Next slide, please. So the French EGALIM Act established a two-year trial to introduce a weekly vegetarian menu in school canteen starting in November 2019. So as an alternative to meat or fish dishes, the vegetarian menu can include other animal-based foods such as dairy products or eggs, or plant-based foods such as grain and pulses. And this was asked by the Director General for Health and the Director General for Food to assess the impact of introducing meat and fish-free menu on the nutritional intake of primary school children and the necessity to recommend weekly minimum or maximum frequency of vegetarian menus. So to answer this question, ANSES matched several databases, including uh, technical food data sheets offered in school canteen collected by the UNSCOL group, a table of nutritional composition called SQL 2020 of the food composing the dishes as described by these data sheets and data on the frequency of presentation of different dishes in menu collected in 2020 by AgroParitech, which is a French university. Next slide, please. So the menu served in the school canteen were divided into several categories based on the title and recipe of the main dishes and other dishes such as starter and side dishes. Menu containing meat, fish or seafood as an appetizer or in the main course or side dish were classified as menu with fish or meat. Menu without any of these ingredients in the starter or in the main course and its garnish were categorized as meat and fish free. Among these vegetarian menu, three types were distinguished. So egg-based menu, cheese-based menu, and plant-based menus. Plant-based menu were also divided into menu that explicitly contain soy in the main course, those that explicitly contain legumes other than soy in the main course, and those containing vegetables or grains. So to estimate the menu nutritional composition, we assume that this menu included the label item on the display menu, plus one press of bread and one glass of water. The serving size were the one from the French recommendation. Next slide, please. So when we look at the comparison of the menu nutritional composition, uh, we see that the menu with meat had more protein, vitamin B1, B3, B6, and things, but less vitamin E. The menu uh, with fish uh, had obviously more EPA plus DHA, which are long chain fatty acid, and vitamin D and vitamin B12, but less um, linoleic acid. Egg based vegetarian menu contain more lipid, vitamin A, B2, B5, iron, iodine, selenium, and phosphorus than other menus. And cheese based 
cheese-based menu contain more energy, lipids, saturated fatty acid, alpha-linolenic acid, carbohydrates, sugar, calcium, sodium, than other, other menu, but less potassium. Plant-based menu also had high level of alpha-linolenic acid, carbohydrate, sugar, and higher content of fiber, folate, magnesium, and copper than the other menu. Content in saturated fat, vitamin B2 and B12 were the lowest. Now regarding plant-based menu, those with soy at the main course contain more protein, linolenic acid, alpha-linolenic acid, vitamin B3, magnesium and copper than other plant-based menu. EPA plus DHA, vitamin E and K1 and selenium level were lower in menu with legumes as a main course than in other plant-based menu. And fiber, vitamin B6, B9, iron, zinc, and potassium content were lower in menu, where the main course contains cereals or vegetables than in other plant-based menu. However, vitamin D and B12 level were higher in menu with grains or vegetables as a main course than in menu with legumes. Next slide, please. As we know, school meals do not constitute the totality of children's food intake over the day and even less over the week. But they are added to a set of food intake outside the school environment, such as the breakfast, possible snack, dinner, weekend consumption, and the impact of consuming a menu of different categories on children's daily nutritional intake was estimated by simulation using consumption data from the French Inca 3 survey, which is a study on the food consumption of eating habits of the French population and the nutritional composition of the collected menu. So if we consider no vegetarian menu to all school lunch as vegetarian menu, this simulation showed that EPA plus DHA, which are, which are long chain fatty acid intakes decrease with a percentage of vegetarian menu from 80% to 60% of the dietary reference value. Similarly, vitamin D intake decreased with a percentage of meat and fish free menus and remain well below the dietary reference value. Next slide, please. Simulation results also show that intake of vitamin B3, B6, B12, and zinc decrease with a percentage of meal without meat or fish, but always remain above the dietary reference values. And for other nutrients, it stays stable and above the dietary reference values. Next slide, please. So in order to consider iron intake according to matrix-dependent bioavailability, more accurate simulation were performed. So a bioavailability coefficient of 16%, which is the value used by ANSES to establish the dietary reference value, was applied to the iron intake without lunch. As you can see on the first row, it's 6.6 milligram on average in the Inca 3 study. Assuming that the child follow a diet that includes animal product, as it is generally the case in France. So to this non-lunch intake weighted by its bioavailability, the average iron intake of the canteen's menu was added. So with a bioavailability of 16% for the menu with meat or fish and 10% for the diverse uh, vegetarian menu. So the simulation show that the intake of bioavailable iron is sufficient even in the case of consumption of vegetarian menu at all the child's school lunch, regardless of the type of vegetarian menu. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, we can say that the introduction of a variable proportion from zero to 100% of vegetarian meal does not substantially change the nutritional status of children. So we did not uh, set up a maximum frequency that it didn't seem relevant. However, many with fish are important contributor of EPA and DHA and of vitamin D. And we know that intakes are insufficient in this nutrient. So we need to pay particular attention to the frequency of menu with fish. And it's also important to take other components of the meal into account as they can be decisive in terms of intake of certain nutrients, such as calcium, vitamin B12, or, or IAG. So this analysis was based on simulation and average intake, and we need more accurate data uh, allowing to consider specific subs of population and also according to real consumption. 
So we also need to know more about intake outside the school meal and socioeconomic status and so on. So thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Perrine. That this is really a fascinating and really detailed analysis. And well, at least so far, it seems to me uh, that 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 what is critical is the, the composition of uh, the, the menu as such, rather than whether it's vegetarian or non-vegetarian. Maybe that is sort of not the, the critical component uh, of it. But I'm, I'm really interested to hear, uh, obviously, for, for, from our next speakers in, in how far that, that is confirmed or what, what angles um, there are. So we can hopefully have a, a few moments for further discussion as well. And, I would uh, very much uh, like to introduce our next speaker, Marie Marianne Sabinski, uh, who is working at the Danish Veterinary and Food Administration in the Sustainable Diet and Health Division. Marianne, your, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Nikolai, for the presentation and the invitation to present our dietary guidelines for meals, good for health and climate. Um, Dietary Guidelines for Meals is a translation of our official dietary guidelines, which are recommendations for a healthy and climate-friendly diet. Uh, and we have just uh, launched uh, the Dietary Guidelines for Meals uh, this January, uh, and we have developed the Dietary Guidelines for Meals for uh, childcare centers, for schools, and, for, and canteens. But today I will give you an overall presentation of our dietary guidelines for meals for schools. Um, the dietary guidelines for meals is based on research from the National Food Institute at the Technical University of Denmark. And uh, is, it is also tested among the target group, the kitchen staff, uh, and in dialogue with uh, uh, different stakeholders. Um, the dietary guidelines for meals consist of three tools First, we have some principles for healthy and climate-friendly meals. Then we have uh, the food group overview. And the last uh, tool is portion sizes. And uh, we uh, recommend starting with the principles. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the principles are divided into five five food groups, each having their own color. The five food groups and colors are used throughout the material. Um, the overall principle, uh, please uh, shift, uh, next slide. Yes, you see, no, no, back, yeah, here. Um, the overall principle, which uh, you can see at the top of each pillar point in, uh, in the direction of a more plant-rich diet with less meat. And below in the different pillars, you see uh, what to choose when translating the overall principles into five meals. If you have a school food canteen with several types of meals, you can use the principle for each type of meal, for instance, five sandwiches or five warm meals. Uh, but let, uh, let me give you an example so you can see how uh, you can apply the principles. And the next slide, please. Uh, if we look more into the blue pillar, which describe, uh, des describes the use of protein-rich food, legumes, fish, meat, and egg, we have the overall uh, principles are offer less meat and remember fish and uh, offer legumes more often than meat. And below you see uh, what to choose when translating, uh, translating the principles into five meals. In two of uh, five meals, you should use legumes. And in this example, lentil soup, lentil soup and falafels are served. Fish should be offered in one of five meals. So salmon is offered and chicken is served in one of the five meals while uh, meat should be served in one of five meals. And uh, one of five meals should consist of eggs uh, or others. So here a, a cutting is chosen for the, for the menu. So that's uh, an example uh, of on how to use the principles in planning uh, of five meals. Please shift. 
Um, for vegetables and fruits, uh, you see the principles and they are a minimum one third of all meals should consist of vegetables and or fruits. And remember the dark green vegetables. And for planning of five meals, this means that vegetables and fruit in different colors should be used in, in, in the meals. And specific uh, dark uh, green vegetables should contribute with the, with the amount of uh, uh, fruits and vegetables in one of uh, the five meals. Um, the principles uh, for cereals and potatoes are uh, choose primarily whole grain and worry vary with potatoes. So in four of five meals, uh, you should, should uh, contain whole grain and for variation, potatoes can be used. I think you have caught the idea of turning the principles into five meals. So the last food groups, I will have just mention the overall principles. Uh, for fats, nuts and seeds, the principles are use most often plant-based oils and add uh, nuts and seeds. And the principle uh, for dairy products and cheese in a plant-rich uh, diet is use dairy products and cheese in moderate amounts. Uh, and we also have the principle uh, of a water for all meals and a tip saying uh, use leftovers and avoid uh, food waste. So this uh, was the principles for schools uh, and an explanation on how to use them in planning of uh, five meals. Then we have the food group overview. Next slide, please. The food group overview uh, shows which food you should choose when planning and serving a healthy and climate friendly diet. The food group uh, overview is uh, also, also separated into the five food groups. And if you look into the food group overview, you can, uh, for instance, see that if, uh, if you want to make a healthy and climate friendly choice, you uh, should choose meat from chicken or pork. And furthermore, you, can, you, you have to limit uh, meat from beef and lamb and um, which should uh, maximum consist of 25% um, uh, of the meat you use. Um, please shift. And at last we have uh, the portion sizes which show appropriate amounts uh, for the different types of food groups in different types of meals. We have uh, portion sizes for lunch, lunch and different types of lunch meals a warm uh, lunch meal and sandwich and uh, open sandwiches. Um, and we have also portion sizes for breakfast and between meal snacks and so on. Um, the school children should uh, have portions for lunch which are big enough to make them full. Some, uh, some eat a little more and some a little less. Therefore, the portion sizes should be considered, considered uh, indicative. Um, the portion sizes are also very useful if you want to offer a food item more often than it appears in the principles, uh, then uh, you should just use a smaller amount. Um, so there is uh, room for flexibility when using the dietary uh, guidelines for meals. Um, so that uh, was a presentation on how we translate the knowledge on sustainable diet into the, the design of um, recommendations for school meals. So that was all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marianne. And I, I really like a, a lot how uh, yeah, your presentation and the guidelines are, are designed to be really specific in a way and having these real foods, uh, foods approached. And, it does seem to come back to one of the questions that, that, that was put uh, before in the previous session uh, about the existence of guidelines um, like these. And, and this one really seems very specific and extremely helpful actually to, uh, to those planning meals, because uh, as, uh, 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 as you say, it, it is about sort of translating the general dietary guidelines into, okay, how do you, what does that mean for meals? So th this really looks, um, very, very, uh, like a very useful tool. Um, so we hope to come back to, 
to discussion uh, later on. And uh, so it's time now to introduce our next speaker, Patricia uh, Estacio Colombo, who is research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicines and the Karolinska Institute. And her work essentially revolves around exploring the relationships between dietary habits, health, environmental sustainability with special focus on schools. So please, Patricia. Thanks a lot, Nikolai, um, and good day, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, as Nikolai mentioned, I am a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but I'm also affiliated to the Karolinska Institute, uh, where I uh, was part of a, a project called the Optimat Project, where we aim to foster sustainable dietary habits through optimized school meals. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, so why did we choose to focus on school meals um, in Sweden? Well, in Sweden, uh, the, the conditions or the prerequisites for, for school meals are quite or nearly unique, at least. Um, in Sweden, fully subsidized school meals are served daily to all children between the, year, uh, yeah, between the ages of 6 and 16. This in turn amounts to around 200 million meals per year, which in turn make up a significant share of the pu public procurement of food in Sweden. Looking at school meals in Sweden, we see that around 25 to 30 percent of children's daily energy and nutrient intakes come from the school meal, which in turn indicates that the school meals play an important role in, in providing nutrients and energy uh, overall. And, with that background, we saw this, this opportunity to use school meals as a way to shape dietary habits um, in, to make them uh, more healthy, but, uh, but as well as environmentally sustainable. Next slide, please. So what we did in the project uh, was that we um, carried out, we've carried out three uh, interventions. One of them is still under um, evaluation. However, what we did in, in these interventions was that we used a method called linear programming. And linear programming is a, a very useful tool when you want to minimize or reduce the climate impact of diets or meals without compromising the nutritional quality uh, or uh, adequacy, the affordability uh, and the, um, the acceptability of the meal. So what, what we did essentially was that we designed and served a, a new lunch menu that was optimized to be as similar as possible to usual menus, so what the children are used to eating. Optimized to meet all dietary reference values that exist for school meals and uh, to contain around 500 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, which is in line with what the World Wildlife Fund recommends for school meals or for lunches in general. And for some schools, this meant up to a 40% reduction uh, in greenhouse gas emissions. And the optimization was also performed so that the costs would not increase uh, because we know that uh, schools and municipalities have limited budgets for, for what they can spend on, on uh, school meals. Yes, and so uh, to assess the sort of um, successfulness of, of these menus, we measured uh, food waste and consumption. So that was performed by the kitchen staff in the schools. We had a questionnaire measuring school meal satisfaction uh, that pupils uh, answered during a baseline period where they ate uh, the, the usual food, but also during the intervention period. And then we also uh, performed qualitative uh, interviews. So we had focus group discussions with the kitchen staff preparing the meals, as well as with students in grades five and eight. Next slide, please. And so uh, for the two interventions that we have performed, uh, we could not see any significant changes in food waste, consumption, or school meal satisfaction, which is uh, a very positive result. Uh, this graph, um, I, essentially why I wanted to show you this is because it shows us that um, the, the, the optimized and new sustainable and nutritious 
uh, school menus were not vegan or vegetarian, they were omnivorous. But as Nikolai also um, uh, highlighted after Perrin's talk, uh, there's a shift in the proportions of, of how much the, the different food groups contribute to, to, the, to the menu. So here we can see that uh, vegetables and roots, uh, as well as cereals, uh, increase through the optimization, whereas meat and dairy products are being reduced. And, and looking, if we look at the recipes and the menu as, as a whole, we, do, we actually use more or less the same dishes within the menus. However, the proportion of the different foods within uh, the recipes or the, the dishes were shifted towards uh, more plant-based products. Next slide, please. So uh, we performed the focus group discussions uh, in order to identify barriers and facilitators to scaling up sustainable school meals, uh, not only in Sweden, but also in similar contexts uh, relevant um, for this uh, this audience, I think. Uh, so what we saw when speaking to kitchen staff and students was that both of these groups, they uh, called for you know having more knowledge in terms of what is uh, you know what is sustainable sustainable eating, why is it important, but also having more resources, uh, especially the kitchen staff highlighted uh, that they needed you know time being. You know, Educate, educate in terms of how to produce uh, more plant-based meals, as well as inspiration. Um, and they also, which was also highlighted in, in the, uh, the video for, for Better Meals, um, was that the involvement of stakeholders, all the way from uh, the, the decision makers uh, at the municipalities, down to you know, the principals, teachers, Everyone needs to be involved and 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 um, working, striving to 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 achieve the same goal in order for these types of efforts to to be successful um, long term at least. Um, another thing that came up through the interviews was the importance of focusing on familiar foods. So, for example, um, focus in in the schools that we worked in lentils were more acceptable than than beans for example so that that's something that that the children were familiar with and that that in turn would increase uh, according to to, to their, their perceptions the acceptability of, of plant-based meals uh, the children also spoke about the seasoning the importance of of using the right type of seasoning and also um, in terms of and trying to mimic the seasoning used for meat-based dishes. That was something that the, that the children themselves highlighted as important. And, but also the naming of dishes. You know, the children, they were saying, well, we like vegetables, but we don't like vegetarian food. And, and that's really interesting. Uh, and I think that the, the kitchen staff also highlighted this, of the acceptability of, of uh, you know, serving a food called lasagna rather, rather than vegetarian lasagna uh, was much, uh, much more favorable um, so that's also something very interesting that, that came out of these interviews. Um, increasing exposure uh, and also making plant-based dishes and, and sustainable meals part of, of you know, everyday practice was something that came up, uh, as well as introducing the meals as early as poss possible. So potentially already in, in preschool uh, was something that came up as important. And lastly, um, in order to be, to be able to scale up and make these types of you know, optimized, nutritious, climate-friendly, affordable and acceptable meals available uh, on a broader scale, we need uh, automi automatized tools uh, that meal planners can use on a daily basis to design and, and yeah, produce uh, these type of, types of menus. Um, and this is something that we're looking into. So if you're interested in know more about that, then uh, yeah, please stay in touch. And then next slides is just to thank you and to also acknowledge the people that I've been working with in this project. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Patricia. This is uh, really very, uh, very interesting. And I would say definitely this experience, uh, well, although conducted in one place, that does really seem to be very much uh, transferable. And also your 
lessons. And I, th I think it, it does seem striking how many different ways there are to, uh, in, well, in, increase the and ensure the acceptability of these, uh, well, these kind of new types or transferred um, transition type, type types of meals, which again refers to a question put in the previous session. And just mm -hmm. looking forward, um, the, the meal planning tools that you mentioned, uh, there might be some really interesting uh, things coming from the uh, best three map project that will be presented in the next session. So that yeah. this is, um, yeah, good, good things to, to, to talk about. Um, I just, uh, please come um, add your questions to the uh, Q&A. We are now moving uh, to our last speaker before our kind of uh, further discussion to uh, Agneta uh, Hernel, who is professor at the Department of Food, Nutrition and Culinary Science of the Umeå University. And uh, she's also a registered dietitian representing the European Federation of the Association of Dietitians, or EFAD, uh, more, more shortly today. So please, Agneta. Thank you, Nikolai. Uh, I would like to take, thank you, uh, the organizers, for the chance to talk on, on uh, um, behalf of EFAD and uh, its network, actually, for food service dietitians, uh, who I'm, I am a member of. Our group decided that the Swedish example would be interesting for the discussion today, and we have already heard Patricia talk about uh, some of the parts of it. So there will be a little bit of repetition, I think. Uh, the title of my talk is Reflections on Health and Sustainable Diets. And uh, uh, this very interesting session has so far focused mainly on specific foods and nutrients. And I will broaden the discussion a bit as healthiness and, and sustainability is about so much more than just the foods and the nutrient content. Next, please. I will start by introducing this uh, concept model for all public meals in Sweden. It, it's from the National Food Agency. And I will come back to it later. For now, I just want to point out that the concept model includes six different puzzle pieces that need to be taken into consideration when planning the meals. And this is both school meals and other public meals we have in Sweden. Next, please. So like Patricia said, school meals are an integrated part of the Swedish welfare system and paid through general taxes, which means that about 260 million free daily meals is served in school, schools each year. And my hum, higher number is because um, the, the free meals include all children in compulsory school aged 6 to 16, but also most children in secondary school aged 16 to 19. And for many children, the school meal is the most nutritious meal they eat during the day. And th this means that the school meals has been shown to even out socioeconomic differences. And it is therefore important for public health in Sweden. And it's also a way that we use for uh, more and more for accustoming children to foods that we think are nutritious. Um, well, the school meals have several um, requirements to fulfill, and one of them is that they should be nutritious and give about a third of recommended daily intake. And the recommendation it's based on, it's the Nordic nutrition recommendation, which also includes sustainability aspects. And the main course is always hot, and at least one alternative main course should be available. This is often nowadays a vegetarian meal. Uh, there should also be a salad bar, bread and, and butter or other spread, and water is always served. Um, as we drink a lot of milk in Sweden uh, for various reasons, uh, milk is also usually served, but nowadays often plant-based varieties are also uh, available for the children. And the children in most schools, possibly except the smallest ones, they take their food themselves. They serve themselves both from the hot, for the hot course and the uh, salad bar. Next, please. The salad bar should include at least five different components every day. It should be three different fiber-rich vegetables, root vegetables, such as carrots, cabbage, parsnips, cauliflower, and such. And in Sweden, potatoes are not seen as a vegetable. Uh, there should also be one legume. It could be green beans, peas, chickpeas, uh, etc. And they could either be as in their sort of normal form or as hummus or something like that. 
And there should also be one salad veg vegetable or fruit. And the salad vegetables that, that could be like salads, tomatoes, cucumber, spinach, and so on. Next, please. So I'm back to the, the uh, let's see now. Oops, sorry. I'm back to the Swedish model or from the National Food Agency. And I will just give you a brief summary of the different uh, parts of the, uh, this concept model, starting with nutritious. And as I said, the meal should uh, be nutritious, but not only nutritious. In, in part of this puzzle piece is that uh, the schools are told that I need to follow up on how much the, of the offered food uh, the, the pupils actually eat. Um, the next puzzle piece is safe. The, it's important that the staff have knowledge about food safety regulations and also that the regulations should be followed. And uh, it's one part of that, the safety issue is that the pupils with special food needs, for instance, due to allergies and intolerances, should also be able to eat a proper meal without being afraid of getting sick. Uh, of course, the meals should be tasty. If a meal is not tasty, it won't be eaten. So meals are based on the pupils' needs and wishes. And much effort is put into involving them in planning of the meals and any changes of the content. And like Pat Patricia said, it's, it's important to have them involved also in, in uh, uh, well, naming and so on. And to especially when you start changing the content and want to add new things. The meals should also be integrated. And that means that uh, the school meals should contribute to the pedagogic mission of the schools and used as a teaching tool. And there are various ways of doing this, where also the National Food Agency gives some ideas and guidelines to the schools on how they can do this. Um, the meals and the school restaurant should uh, be pleasant. It should be a pleasant meeting place for pupils and staff. Uh, in most schools, at least in the up to I'm gonna say um, up to the age of 15, 16, the teachers and the pupils eat together. So it's a way of uh, getting to know each other a bit more and so on. And the final puzzle piece is being eco smart. Food waste from cooking, serving, and plates should be minimized, and food should be chosen taking environment and animal welfare into consideration. And this includes the procurement process. Uh, so my final message is that it's important to consider all these aspects together. As an example, if the food is nutritious but not tasty, the pupils won't eat it and plate waste will be high. And then if the plate waste is decreased by cooking less food, all pupils won't be able to eat a full meal and it will thus, thus no longer be nutritious for all. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Anjata. Too, uh, it was a really beautiful image, and I think it's it's indeed important to to have this this, this wider uh, element um, addressed, and, and indeed, especially that really it, it's it's not only about the nutrition and environment, but indeed it needs to be pleasant and 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 tasty and so sort of in, engaging um, in many ways. And I also found really helpful and kind of important, maybe also for the. Well, actually, for the discussion before and also for the discussion after, th this kind of mentioning how how the school food system is part of the welfare system, and I think that that really is becoming um, a point which which is well gaining in in importance uh, now nowadays to to kind of reflect how how we should uh, go about this. So I would really like to invite all the um, the speakers to. Um, uh, to join the the Q and A, so I have a few um, specific uh, questions uh, from the that I see from the chat, and then further we can um, well discuss. So uh, I, I think one of the questions, and, and I feel that 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 came to uh, Perin uh, especially, is about a cheese-based vegetarian menu, how it could be containing more car carbohydrates. So so I guess that's a question for clarification on the uh, on your presentation. Yes, so I answer to the question, I don't know if it broke or not. 
so I explained that uh, in the cheese base menu, um, we had uh, um, meal like cheese pasta, cheese crepes, cheese nuggets, or breaded cheese, cheese pie, cheese pancake, what we call croque monsieur. So all this meal actually also contains uh, grains and pasta, so they were also high in carbohydrates. Okay, hopefully that, that's an answer to the question. And maybe, uh, well, actually a question for uh, who wants to address it, but I think qu quite, quite a few mentioned the importance of fish. Um, however, and here the, the question is, especially from the point of view of a landlocked country, it is perceived that uh, ecology sustainability is hard somehow to combine because of that. Do you have any specific uh, reflections on, uh, on that question? I see there's no direct uh, kind of uh, anything that, that, that comes, uh, comes to mind. So another specific um, question is uh, actually for Patricia about uh, tools for meal planning that you mentioned. So do you have any examples or uh, any thoughts? And again, if um, either Marianne or Perrine or Agneta, you have uh, something to say about this, please also come in. Thank you, Nikolai, and uh, thanks for the question. Um, as for meal planning tools, and I can only, sp only speak for Sweden at the moment, there, there are uh, the meal planners in the municipalities that use uh, different types of, of meal planning tools. However, uh, what the challenge has been and, and the gap that we've tried to sort of close with this optimization approach uh, is um, that, that currently uh, the meal planners, uh, they, they design the menus and then they realize, oh, but we want to make it less, you know, or more climate friendly and they change some things within the menu, reduce some of the meat and increase more pulses, for example. But then they see that, oh, wow, well, the price increased or, or um, the nutritional composition deteriorated from, from, from these shifts. Uh, and so they, you know, again, go in and, and change some things and then they see, okay, so now the nutritional composition is better, but we, yeah, we didn't achieve the goals that we want with, with regards to the climate impact or the, you know, the price increase or whatever. So in this approach um, that we've developed, we're, we have this optimization approach, which aligns all of these priorities so you can you know sort of the aim is in the future to, to be able to press a button and say okay we want to design a menu that has you know 500 grams in that on average of carbon dioxide equivalents per meal uh, that is nutritionally adequate uh, that is affordable that does not cost more than x amount of you know euros or crowns uh, per day but that is still as similar as possible uh, to the, uh, to the what children are you, are eating today in uh, as a proxy for for acceptability so we have you know we have this approach but currently it's not really user friendly so that's that's our goal actually to, to develop this type of tool that can be used not only in Sweden but also in the wider uh, I mean Europe uh, but, uh, but in other countries and all, all countries working with with school meals or public sector meals so I don't have uh, that particular tool or any particular tool that can combine all of these things in a user-friendly or and and effective way at the moment but that's uh, our long-term goal at the moment to, to develop such a tool Thanks for the answer. Marianne, do you, do you have maybe um, something to come in on that? Yeah, well, I, I think it, um, it could be a very uh, helpful tool for the kitchen uh, when planning um, healthy and climate friendly um, menus. So, um, yeah, exciting. But but in in um, in your experience, you, you 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 in Denmark, you're not not aware of uh, well either work on such tools or how because in a way to some degree, well, what you have presented is is really a guideline. Maybe whether yeah. you call that a tool or yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we we do not uh, develop such a tool here. Um, 
but I know um, there, uh, there are some projects um, working on uh, tools uh, to support the, the kitchen when they want to uh, work on, um, on um, healthy and uh, climate friendly diets. Um, so, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I don't know, Agneta or Perrine, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this specifically? Sadly, in France, we don't have that kind of tool, but it would be, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but difficult. So I wish you the best for, for making it because it's it would be really good if it could be sort of mastered all these different aspects because it's tricky. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, I see another question that came in um, uh, about the, the kind of the importance of uh, children's participation in um, in, in meal planning um, and which kind of well is meant and should, should give a more of a sense of co-creation co-ownership for their own um, yeah healthy sustainable meals uh, but it, it brings questions of um, skills competences literacy and I think it, it has been addressed in in quite a few um, well also in the previous session but also um, from your side um, can you speak uh, more about this, so sort of how this, this is done uh, or maybe is not yet sufficiently done and how should this maybe be, what, what are good ways of, of, of ensuring this? Well, in Sweden, one of the advantages we have is that uh, common consumer studies are obligatory for all children, regardless of gender. Uh, unfortunately, it's the smallest subject in the school, so it's not like a huge one, but they do learn quite a lot about nutrition and cooking and a little bit about economy as well. It, it would be good if that subject could be much larger and also be for uh, high school, so it's not just the, the youngest children. No, it's the fifth graders and eighth and ninth grade usually. Uh, but. Uh, this and also what could be improved is the collaboration. I mean, the goal is for, for as you saw, that the meals should be integrated. Uh, the one problem is that uh, schools, uh, uh, the, the food organization is responsible for what they serve. And, and uh, so, but, but uh, uh, the school is responsible for the timing and uh, restaurant the, the where they sit and that this is not always very easy because uh, um, and they have put in a lot of effort to try to merge these uh, so they work better together because that's important so that the schools really not see the see the see the school meals as the opportunity it is for for improving uh, both school results and eating and health and all those aspects uh, because they could learn quite a lot more than they actually do from the school meals. Please, wh whoever uh, wants to come in. Because it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, just uh, commenting on on a question. Or, yeah. Uh, uh, from from Dorota, um, that was actually something that came up uh, in the interviews as well. Uh, children wanting to be more involved and sort of uh, feeling that they weren't uh, enough involved in in the actual uh, development and, and design of, of the meals and the menus. So uh, so that's something that I I, I feel giving. Uh, empowering uh, students and children in that way and, and extending that you know beyond the educational aspect of learning about you know how to cook and, and the economy and everything I think that could be really key uh, and as well as um, the kitchen staff also to um, support them in, in their uh, ambition and, and willingness to learn um, because at the moment as it is it is a stressful, uh, time limited. They don't have much time to to learn new skills, or you know, maybe the head, the the the, 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 the um, sort of head chef is sometimes uh, able to go and you know do a course or, or so. Uh, but I think 
making that available available more widely and also more, more focused now on, on plant-based cooking. Uh, I think that could be um, a way to increase skills, but also to increase um, inspiration. And, and ultimately as well, at least in Sweden, the kitchen staff, they are the ones who have the, the ability to sell the food to the students because they're there, they meet the students every day. And if they are inspired, uh, then it's likely that uh, they would would be able to inspire students uh, as well. So, and this is actually something that, that the kitchen staff have they have said said this in in, in the interviews. So, um, yeah. Thanks, um, Mariano Perin. Uh... Well, I can I can uh, say just a little, but uh, it's. Um... It's very different how schools, uh, school food programs is organized in the in Denmark. Um, some projects show uh, show good results on integrating the the children, but but many schools just um, sell a sandwich or so. Um, so yeah, but uh, of course I think it's it's uh, it's uh, very. Um, yeah, the, the children, it's a, there's some um, positive effects on, on integrating the children. And I really like the broader perspective that you brought in, Agneta, with uh, your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Green, uh... Yes, so um, in France, we don't really, uh, children are not really involved or have a sterile in on the what's in the menu though, it's more the parents. But we do have some activities uh, to increase awareness on the impact of food waste, for example. And they have also uh, nutrition classes and other type of events like that, but they can't, they're not really involved into the cooking, which could be a good idea. And, and maybe, uh, thanks a lot. And, and maybe a very last question before we, uh have to move on there's there's a question about the um the diversity um uh, component of this uh, because with a uh, an increasingly diverse um growingly diverse population the question goes how do you uh, promote the health aspects of different cuisines in uh, the, the and, and different sort of tastes and, um, and, and, and um, yeah, also cultural preferences in a way. So, so how does that fit the matrix? Uh, and, and of course, and yet, yeah, that is kind of the part of the matrix as far as yeah. I understand that you presented, but yeah. also in light of, um, yeah, how do you design and balance all these uh, things together? Well, I, I think that in Sweden, they, they, well, one thing is that they, since you usually have two options and the kids can actually choose to take both, a little bit of both. And they often have introduced like taste, um, what you call taste spoons. So they can take like a spoon and taste the thing a little bit before they actually take, if there's a new thing being introduced. Um, most schools I think also have this, well, sort of uh, now and then um, like a, uh, country week or something like that so they have foods from a specific country as, as like one set of courses and uh, also i think that depending on where you are because i mean all schools they, or the municipalities decide on the menus themselves so i mean it's not like it's not the same fo food in all schools it varies across the country so if you have a larger community with with from specific countries you usually sort of add the doors you, you look at what your pupils, where they come from, and add foods from their specific countries, sort of, and try to, I th I'm fairly sure, uh, I, I shouldn't swear on it, but I'm fairly sure that most schools try to add foods that are, are uh, sort of showing this, their diverse population of pupils. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, that's uh, that's also my impression for having worked with with different types of schools in, in different places in, in in Sweden. Is that uh, even though one municipality has the same menu, 
the, the, the different schools adapt the, the, the dishes, the seasoning, the, 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 you know, the, the sort of some of the products that to match the the um, yeah the, the the preferences of, of the, the students, which can vary from from one area to another. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th th thanks so much for that. So, if, any more uh, thoughts on on this particularly, um, Mariano Terim? Because it's it, it does seem indeed quite sometimes I would say not say quite often, but sometimes you you have this this. Uh, perspective that's being put into debate like oh yeah you have these dietary guidelines so therefore everyone's eating one diet which is of course a, a, a bit foolish because you can design so many different uh, menus with uh, with this uh, with a certain amount of food uh, uh, i mean if you look at the fao there's tens of thousands of uh, species of edible plants so i mean it, it's hard to argue that you cannot design sort of diverse meals with that um, so I uh, thank you very much uh, for your participation and great insights. Um, we will soon go into uh, a quick uh, five minute stretching break before we uh, move to our last panel about accelerating the uptake of healthy, sustainable meals in, in schools. And for me, this, this particular session, so the one we just had, is really important because one of the key takeaways as I see it is that there's no trade-off per definition between nutritionally healthy, environmentally sustainable meals for school children. And I think that was sort of kind of clear for, for uh, by now for, for adults, but there were always a bit more questions about the kind of um, school children especially. But I, I do feel now that uh, we can be confident that moving forward with this um, type of approach is really uh, good and um, and important, and that really what is at the heart of it is to have a good design of the, of, of the menus, um, uh, and uh, so to move this forward. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, let's go for a quick quick break, and then we're back at twelve uh, in a few minutes. <laughs>